Okay, everyone, welcome. We are live on Facebook for our April webinar talk with the National Council for Black Studies. At this time, I would love to open the floor, well, release the floor to our president, Dr. Valerie Grimm, um, who is our current president of the National Council for Black Studies to welcome everyone. Good evening, everyone. Hope you've had a blessed week and a great day. I want to first begin by thanking Dr. Fonette, who is doing a fabulous job programming and creating opportunities for us to have conversation all across the country about issues that, that concern us, things that we want to do and things that we need to be doing. I would also like to welcome our guest tonight, Dr. Lindsay Gary, uh, who is a filmmaker. And I hope that you will enjoy intellectual stimulation with her discussing her film, Who Your People. I love the title of that documentary film. You know, like, Who Your People? Y'all my people. NCBS my people. And so I, I want to welcome you. I want you to just come to this discussion with an open mind, uh, with the understanding that we are more than what people see that we make up our different identities and who we are, where we come from, and what we eat, how we dance, how we engage music, that our culture is rich, is not monolithic, and that we are a diverse people. And as such, we have diverse ways of expressing ourselves and indicating and illuminating who we are and who our people are. And from where we have come. So I'm happy and excited tonight just to have another panel discussion of, uh, with Dr. G um, Gary about her work. I hope you will take time, ask questions, hope you watch the documentary so that you can understand um, the journey and the narrative of Creoles in Louisiana and what their African descended experiences have been in the United States. So welcome and enjoy and have a great time with who your people. I like to end by saying, y'all my people. I hope you're your people and uh, let's get with it. Thank you, Dr. Farnett. And thank you for this panel, this webinar discussion again. Thank you so much, Dr. Grimm. And um, as I was preparing with Drs. Um, Gary and Gardner, I was saying we have to let people know how this talk even came to be because at NCBS, as you all know, we meet once a year annually for our conference. And Dr. Gary um, had actually missed her presentation. She, you know, she accidentally misread the program book and she came to um, Dr. Alfonso Simpson, who is our vice president at conference chair. And she was like, I don't know what to do. I misread it. He said, you know what? No problem. You see Dr. Fontenet over there? We're going to take care of you. And as NCBS says, we take care of our people. And we said, Dr. Gary, you are going to have the opportunity to present your research, to have this talk and discussion. And as a matter of fact, instead of the 15 minutes you will have to share with three others on the panel, we're going to give you your own talk. So to all of our NCBS members who are out there, please know that if you have a presentation, if you have an article, if you have a book, any scholarship or community talk on any pressing topic that is currently happening that impacts Black people, that impacts the discipline, please reach out to any one of us. You can email me me directly, you can email Dr. Grimm, you can email Dr. Alfonso. As a matter of fact, you can email any member of our board and we will be sure to allow you to use this space because this is your space as well, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with our introductions because Dr. Gary um, and Dr. Gardner, they are very excited. So as you all know, we have Dr. Gary who is a professor scholar, conceptual diaspora artist, an Afrocentric entrepreneur whose mission is to educate, connect, and empower the African diaspora. She graduated from the University of Houston with a BA in history and minor in dance and business administration, and later obtained her graduate certificate in African American studies. She also has an MA in history and MPA in public policy, um, and MFA in dance, and recently obtained her PhD in Africology and African American Studies from Temple University. Matter of fact, Dr. Grimm just got off a beautiful talk with Dr. Malefe Asante. It is posted on our NCBS page in case you missed it. Um, Dr. Gary is an adjunct professor of African American Studies at the University of Houston, 
and of History at Houston Community College, in addition to being the Executive Director of the Reeducation Project, the Artistic and Executive Director of Dance Africana LLC, and the Co-Director of Aid L Properties in Nigeria. She is also the CEO of Insegul Enterprises LLC. This sister is busy. She is doing the work in the community. She is also the author of the New Red Book, A Guide to 50 of Houston's Black Historical and Cultural Sites, as well as the director and creator of Who You People, which is what we're discussing tonight, which is a film that explores the African heritage of Louisiana. And also, by the, when she sent me this bio, she could not put this next comp, this, this next statement in there. But this week, this sister also opened a, a, a bookstore in Lafayette, Louisiana, which only holds books that center around Black women. Okay, so this 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 young sister is truly doing the work. Um, we have our other speaker here who assisted Dr. Gary, and Dr. Gary will also give more insight into how she and uh, Jennifer collaborated on this work. Um, Dr. Gardner was born and raised in the artistically diverse Chicago area. She is accustomed to understanding and connecting the nuances of building community and powerful networks. Jennifer has served on the executive board of the Chi Lambda chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Inc Incorporated. She has helped numerous nonprofit organizations reorient their goals and small firms build effective marketing blueprints. She holds a BA in African and Black Diaspora Studies and a minor in International Studies and the MA in Africology and African American Studies from Temple University in which she specializes in popular culture, hip hop and community-based education. Jennifer has worked with Lindsay as a communications and marketing consultant. She currently serves as the assistant director for the Center for Black Diaspora and DePaul University. So at this time, I would like to turn over this platform to you beautiful ladies and please let's talk about who you people. Thank you so much, Alicia and Dr. Grimm. And I want to say thank you and hotep to everyone on this webinar and on our uh, live stream on Facebook. Thank you for attending this incredible conversation. Thank you, NCBS and Dr. Fontenet for just allowing us to come on and share this in a greater context. Uh, as the introduction has explained, we're here with this excellent distinguished subject matter expert, Dr. Lindsey Gary. Um, to kind of give us a little bit more insight into this film, into the research, the culture, the people, the community, and the legacy that um, this film is centered around. So, Lindsay, I know you have a presentation. Um, let's also share your screen and get started. Yes, well, as I um, pull up my presentation, I just want to say thank you all so much um, for the opportunity to share. Um, I'm very, very excited to share this with a larger audience, um, especially to share it with NCBS and the greater community for NCBS. Um, it's a very important topic. Um, one thing Alicia, Dr. Fontenet didn't mention is that we share this connection to Louisiana, um, Jennifer as well. And um, it's very near and dear to my heart as someone who uh, was born in Houston, born and raised in Houston, but uh, has deep cultural ties um, to Louisiana, of course, originally from Africa, but by way of Louisiana. So it's just an honor to be able to share and give uh, more voice to my ancestors and to my immediate community. So I'm really tremendously thankful for how a mistake <laughs> that you all handled with such grace. <laughs> Getting morph into this. So thank you all. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Grimm as well. So um, I want to share my screen um, really quickly so you can um, get a little bit more background information about uh, what the film entails. Um, you already kind of saw uh, the information um, with the film, but I want to go over a little bit more about the background, how I conducted the research and why I chose to do it in this way. So my research was originally based on a uh, a kind of a quaalite or creoleness perspective. So when I originally uh, started researching my immediate culture and community, I was a little girl. You know, I always had a keen interest in that. And so, oh wait, can y'all not see the presentation? Uh oh, let me let me stop share. One second. It went away on my end. Can y'all see it now? No, not yet. 
Okay, I'm so sorry. Let me see. I can get this to share. One second. Okay, so I'm gonna try this again. Y'all bear with us. Can y'all see it now? Yes. yes. Okay, if I do this, can y'all see it? Uh, see loading. Okay. For some reason, it's not letting me share the full screen, but that's okay. Y'all can see it here, right? Okay. Sorry about that. So um, basically what I'm looking at is my um, my research, right? So how I started, I originally had a different perspective um, and I approached it in a, in, a, in a perspective that didn't really always feel correct and right. And so um, when I started at Temple, I was immediately um, intrigued by the Afrocentric approach um, to this uh, research about my culture um, in Louisiana, which is known as the Creole culture, right? And so almost immediately, I would say within the first month or so of being a PhD student, I decided to try to look at my culture from an Afrocentric lens. And that's really what transformed my film and actually encouraged me to, re to resume working on it because I'd actually stopped working on it for a number of years because something felt off in the way that I was telling the story. Um, and so it wasn't until I started at Temple that I actually decided to continue with the film in 2019. So I worked on the film, on completing the film alongside my dissertation, which I, you know, recently defended in December. So um, I want to give thanks to my ancestors who guided me along this process. Um, this image is a collage of uh, ancestors from both sides. My people are from New Iberia, St. Martinville, and from Lafayette in Southwest Louisiana. So definitely have to give uh, thanks to them. And I want to kind of go over a little bit about um, the statement um, of the problem, which you're going to see it presented in the film, which you've already seen, right? So essentially a lot of our culture, which is known as Creole culture in Southwest Louisiana and sometimes called Cajun, is very much so underestimated and undermined. Um, it's under articulated. And so there's a lot of you know, rhetoric that basically states that majority of our culture comes from France, Europe. It's all about, we, Alicia will tell you, we grew up being called Frenchmen, right? A lot of that is not really giving credit to the enslaved people who contributed much of what is our culture. And that's everything from spiritual practices to food, to music to language and so um using afrocentricity i was able to illuminate those things and really see how the foundation of the culture is fundamentally african of course there are going to be other influences here and there right because we were in a colonial uh situation a situation of enslavement but it doesn't it didn't mean that our ancestors didn't practice agency it didn't mean that they didn't fight hard to maintain who they were and who we are now. So basically the problem that I was presenting is that the culture is predominantly African, but we don't acknowledge that. We don't claim that. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that it is understudied. A lot of people have a very small idea of what it means to be an African person, what African culture is, how it manifests in environments. Um, and there's a lack of scholarship. And, you know, people from Louisiana will tell you when they say they're from Louisiana, people automatically think New Orleans, right? They automatically think, you know, the big city. And for that reason, a lot of the, the scholarship around us, you know, so-called Creole culture is based on that region, which is a different part of Louisiana. So I have this map here to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about the part in green. This is the real... Louisiana, no shade to everybody else, right? But the part in green, so uh, St. Martin Parish, you have Vermilion, like all these areas is what I'm looking at. Um, Vert and Iberia Parish, you also have um, the part in like this purpley color is what is typically studied. Um, when we talk about what is African and how these contributions exist, it's automatically uh, kind of by default, this region. And so because of that, a lot of the region in the green is understudied and it's looked at as this different kind of manifestation of a Creole culture or a, a manifestation of even French culture or Cajun culture. And so through my research, what I'm illustrating is how 
again, even things that are considered Cajun are really African. Um, one thing uh, you, you'll probably see in the film or you've seen in the film is the fact that, you know, you can go somewhere and people will call gumbo Cajun. And gumbo is an African word for one, which means okra. Okra is an African crop. Okra is not native to Europe. So no, nothing about that demonstrates that that could have come from France. Nothing about it, right? And that's just one of the many examples that I think are very tangible for people because gumbo is like our main dish. You know, that's the main thing we eat, right? So essentially I'm using the film and the dis dissertation to illustrate this point. And um, ultimately I'm gonna use, um, of course, Afrocentricity, but I also use the quailness theory or the quailite th theory to showcase the differences in how utilizing different theories will show you different results, right? So when I was initially doing my, my master's in history, I use a lot of this uh, Creole theory and it didn't really feel out like it was like it was right. It, something about it felt off, which is why I stopped making the film in the first place because I didn't really think that the approach was correct or uh, accurate, um, but I couldn't pinpoint why, okay? And so um, a lot of this, you can see the differences. The, the Quayle-Tate theory is looking at African culture as an influence, a minor influence in the culture of Southwest Louisiana, whereas Afrocentricity reveals that it's more of a foundational aspect. So it's the basis of a lot of our cultural customs rather than just, oh, a slight influence, which is what, you know, this is how people associate our culture. It's like, oh yeah, some of our people came from Africa and there's like, you know, it's kind of a like an afterthought. Um, it also with uh, Creole, Creole Tate, it looks at um, culture as an indigenous fusion. So part of it is that, you know, culture is created in a new environment and, you know, it's a fusion of potentially equal proportions, right? So Europeans, Native Americans, Africans contributing equally to the same culture. And not that we're trying to necessarily quantify all of that because, you know, you have different exceptions, but there's just simply not an equal contribution, simply put. Um, you have Africa as the foundation. You have African people formulating this culture. So it makes sense for them to be the, 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 the ones contributing greatly to it. And in addition to that, you can make the argument that the culture is created, but in, in using Afrocentricity, I'm able to showcase how it's actually a version of continuity, right? Where things that were happening in Africa continue in a new environment, maybe a slightly different manifestation, but there's a continuation, not this, we, we lost our culture rhetoric that we're often taught. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of this because um, you can see that I did a number of interviews. I've interviewed everybody from family members uh, such as Erica, who's uh, one of my cousins on my father's side um, to you know, you know, cultural bearers um, people who are chefs, activists, musicians, such as RJ, who's a Zotico artist, um, spiritual leaders, um, most of the spiritual leaders, the treaters, they didn't want to be on camera, um, but I, util I utilize their research um, in my work, both the film and the dissertation, um, and people who speak the language, which is called Kourivini now, was once, you know, and sometimes still referred to as Louisiana Creole, right, um, so I use all of this and I wasn't asking questions like, tell me what about our culture is African. When I first started trying to make the film, I was asking that kind of question. But when I decided to resume and I quickly realized that wasn't the way to approach it because many of us in our community don't recognize or know that it is African. So by asking that question, they're automatically like confused. Like, well, I don't know. They just know what they grew up with. You have to realize this region is very rural. It's not the big city. So this is not to say that they don't know things, right? Because they do, but they may not have met someone from the continent perhaps, or, you know, have something to compare it to, to say, oh, this is similar to what my friend from Ghana does or what my friend from Jamaica does. You know, a lot of us have been in the region for centuries with amongst the same groups of people, the same group of people, right? So we may not recognize our culture as African, even though it is. Um, for example, the fact that gumbo is an African word, many people didn't even know that just five years ago. It's a word we use, 
but we didn't necessarily know it was an African word. So doesn't mean that we aren't practicing African culture just because we don't know that we are. And so that's what, you know, the film kind of portrays. So I essentially was asking questions like, what is our culture? What do we value? What do we do? What are the things we do? And that, you know, led to, okay, me contextualizing those things as African things and me, you know, showing them the similarities for them to see that. But it wasn't something I just was able to go in and say, tell me what's African. Now, at the same time, there were a couple of people who who went there, which I was very pleasantly happy with because they already had that understanding without me having to like add the context. So somebody like RJ, who was, you know, as you saw in the film, who's like the the cover, the poster child, a uh, poster man, you know, of this film, he was automatically, you know, tapped into that. So, but a lot of our other subjects, uh, interview subjects were not. Um, these are the two main books I use in the research. Um, Africans in Colonial Louisiana, which was written by Gwendolyn Midlow Hall. Um, this book is, um, she actually passed away recently, um, but this book also inspired the book to the right, which is uh, Bukife Gumbo, which is a book written by Ibrahim Asek, who is a um, Senegalese historian. And he works between Dakar and uh, Edgar, which is, you know, a little bit, maybe an hour outside of New Orleans, where the Whitney Plantation is. He's head of research there. And so he was uh, inspired by a presentation that she gave in Senegal about her research, which demonstrated how much of our culture is Senegambian. So there's, you know, some things that are influenced by the region of that's now known as Benin, which was once Dahomey. Uh, some of it is influenced by the Congo region, but the majority of it comes from this Senegambia and Mali region of West Africa. And so he was greatly influenced by her work and published this book, which kind of further demonstrates how much our culture comes from Africa. The beautiful part about this is that they exist, um, but they, again, they're talking about the region around New Orleans. So um, she talks a little bit more about Southwest Louisiana as well. But I was able to use their research to apply it to our region as well. So I'm going to skip through some of this stuff and just give you some uh, quick uh, examples that we saw in the film as well. Um, and some of the ones that we didn't see. So we can uh, get into the clip that I want to show. So in terms of um, in terms of what I found in the different categories of culture, I was blown away. Because initially I was thinking language, food, music, dance. And I didn't necessarily always think about the spiritual part because that is a very taboo part of our culture. You know, people talk about traiteur, they talk about, you know, voodoo or what we call voodoo, but they don't talk about it openly. You know, it's not like something we just like, we talk about it amongst each other, but not necessarily to the greater community or people outside of our community. So that was the part I had the most difficulty finding. But again, my interviewees really surprised me in being, some of them being quite open um, with sharing. And so as you saw in the film, so um, you, I'm gonna skip over the rites of passage part, but in terms of the healing practice practices, Threteers are these traditional healers. They're people who use the land for healing, right? They're people who use herbs, um, any types of things they can found, find in the environment to heal. Prayers obviously are included. They use amulets. They are herbalists, right? And so this is a continuation of something we were doing in Africa. It's not something that was just something we created once we got to Louisiana. It was something that our people turned to. And so one thing that I'm really trying to illustrate is that when people are in a traumatic situation, they turn to what they know. And you also have to keep in mind that there were a lot of Africans who were in close-knit communities. And many of them came from, if not the same groups, groups that spoke mutually intelligible languages. And so they were able to, for that reason, continue a lot of their cultural customs. So that it goes against that narrative that says that they lost culture. In many cases, even the enslavers encouraged marriage, encouraged family relationships because it actually benefited them um, on the plantations and what I found in my research. So it's consistent with why our, our 
cultural customs are still present in 2023. Um, and you're going to see to the right, this is pulled from a dissertation written in the 1930s about um, remedies. So anybody ever heard of Monglier? I'm sure you heard of Monglier, Alicia. Monglier is an herb that is, you know, utilized for all types of, I got. I should have brought it with me. I got a bottle, a, a jar of it right now for a lot of different ailments. And so this was actually taken from community members in St. Martin Parish, which is where my dad's mother is from, St. Martinville. And um, they documented these remedies. And Monglier is actually written here to demonstrate, yeah, it's anti-inflammatory, diabetes, so many things. It's so good for you. And so it's a remedy that, you know, people in Louisiana use for so many different ailments. And actually, Monglier occurred a lot in this document. Um, and you can see it's actually written in Cour Vigny, um, and as well as transcribed into French, or translated into French, I should say. Um, I also want to look at um, food and animals, right? So one thing that's important to point out is that we know, as people who are a part of this community, that enslaved people were taken for very strategic reasons. It wasn't like, oh, like, I'm just going to grab this random person. A lot of it was very strategic. I want someone who has rice growing skills. I want someone who knows how to uh, wrangle cattle, right? To do the work that I need them to do in the place that they're going to go and be enslaved in. And that was no exception in Louisiana. So many of the people who were brought there were coming from Senegal, Gambia, and Mali because of their expertise in certain areas. And so that those expertise, uh, that expertise that existed then still exists today, right? Today, rice is literally the, the food we eat every day, sometimes three times a day, right? As you saw in the film, Jackie talked about the mom was cooking, her mother was cooking rice before she even knew what was going on top of it. We eat eggs and rice for breakfast, jambalaya, beans and rice, whatever kind of bean it is, right? Um, etouffee with rice, gumbo, like rice is our main dish, right? And so also, it's consistent with the fact that these people came from very uh, huge rice growing civilizations in Guinea and Senegal as well. Um, and then also the cattle ranching. A lot of these communities, particularly the Fula people, were brought to uh, Louisiana for that particular skill set. You know, they were riding horses. House of people were riding horses in Africa before they came to, to Louisiana. So it's not inconsistent with that but a lot of times that gets wrapped up into the cowboy western narrative without understanding the ancient connection and the last one I want to talk about because I think we go over music and dance pretty significantly in the film um is language and so we talk about that in the film as well but I want to just highlight that because that is a big point of debate about what our language is qualified for qualified as for the longest, it was considered to be a dialect, right? A dialect of French, you speak in bad French, broken French, right? But it's not broken, it's not a dialect, it is a language, and it's not French. It is a combination of our ancestors utilizing colonial lexicon right, which they had to understand to a certain extent, at the same time as maintaining consciously their grammar and the way that they spoke, how they spoke to each other. So when you look at the way that languages are typically categorized, in general, they're usually categorized by their gra grammar. So if our language is grammatically African, to call it a Creole language doesn't articulate that it's an African language. To call it a broken French doesn't articulate that it's an African language that people have maintained for generations. So as we illustrate in the film, it is an African language in terms of that grammar, although the lexicon is primarily uh, French, but it's clearly a different language, right? So very important to understand it's languages of how we express ourselves it's how we showcase who we are. And our ancestors were very intentional about continuing our legacy 
in all ways, especially the language. Another thing that we see is folk tales, proverbs. Um, in Louisiana, when you translate uh, in Corvigny, how to say, where are you from? It literally translates to, where is your uh, umbilical cord buried? Literally, that is like the literal translation, which is consistent with even things you saw in the Nile Valley calling inner Africa, the land of our placenta, right? Because people in our cultures uh, in the past, a lot of times and sometimes in the present would bury the umbilical cord and bury the placenta after giving birth. And they would bury that in sacred land, ancestral land. So that's still that is still literally the way. But if you look it up, they will qualify that as a Cajun phrase. They will say, that's what I, that's a Cajun thing, right? They will completely remove Africa from the picture, which there are various reasons as to why, but it's important to understand that the Cajun community, well, the Creole community, the, the African community in Louisiana predates the Cajun community. Africans were already in Louisiana before Cajuns were expelled or Acadians were expelled from from Canada by the English. They learned from us, not the other way around. They also learned from indigenous communities like the Atakapa people. So for 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 that we have to be clear that sometimes even Cajun culture is straight up just African. Not everything now. But some things that they call Cajun is not from Canada and it's not from France. It's just not, <laughs> right? There's no such thing as a Cajun gumbo. So with that, I'm going to end. And I'm going to show a quick clip. And actually, this first clip did not make it to the film. Hopefully, y'all can hear it, OK? <laughs> to um end with that um I thought about showing something directly from the film but I really like that clip because first of all it always makes me emotional when I hear it but if you hear the the lyrics uh that Miss Donna Angel is singing she said I'm coming home you know to where I want to be and I really feel like that's a metaphor um for um the work that I'm doing um and helping our uh people in Louisiana my extended family and community um, to see um, something that has been kept from us for a long time um, through education, through media, um, to see who we really are um, and to not romanticize what happened in Louisiana because a lot of our history is very much so romanticized and people don't tell the truth about how things went down. They say, oh, it's, you know, we're French, we mixed and we did, but they don't understand that this mixing was a product of enslavement of of oppression of 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 rape of uh colonial practices it wasn't you know peach king you know so um i believe that if we are able to utilize this film and my research um and implement it into our lives it would really get us closer to understanding ourselves as african people um and uh, really reconnecting with our true roots um, and understanding we we didn't ask to be in this land. This land is something that we brought, we we made it our land, but this is not where we originally came from. And just re respecting our Louisiana roots, but also understanding that 
those roots go across the Atlantic Ocean, you know? So that that song is written by Clifton Chenier, is performed by, uh, he was a Zydeco pioneer, Zydeco music pioneer, and it's performed by uh, Don Angel. So um, I think that will conclude my uh, presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gary. And um, and I know Jennifer um, has some questions to um, lead the audience in dialogue and all attendees um, on here on Zoom, please utilize the Q&A feature if you have a question. To my Facebook Live participants, please use the comment section um, and we can read your questions from there. Um, of, of course, I have to go there, um, Dr. Gary. With everything happening now with the attack on Black studies and Black history and in in particular for Louisiana history. You know, I born and raised in Louisiana. Most people don't know this, but my bachelor degrees are in European history and British lit. Didn't even know about black studies until my senior year in college. Okay. Let's, let's just put it out there. So when it comes to the identity, right, the, the, the impact of knowing one's identity and, and teaching of self, when it comes to Louisiana school system, where do you see your work fitting in with that for black and brown people in Louisiana, particularly Southwest Louisiana? Yes, and, it, and I'm glad you said that because there's a different circumstance. Louisiana is, North Louisiana is different, you know, like there are different circumstances. And I believe that um, I would I would love our work because I'm saying our work because I know that you're doing work as well like this. I would love this work to be in books, um, to be uh, shared with our community members. I, I don't know how long it's gonna take Louisiana to implement this type of curriculum. I don't know that that will happen anytime soon. It needs to happen, but I don't want us to depend on that because we keep fighting for it because we need people on all fronts, but I think we need to put it, this needs to be our own doing. And um, I don't know, what organizations we need to partner with, what community groups, what churches we need to partner with to get this information to people immediately. We can't wait for um, the state to find it in important enough because honestly, they're after the dollar. The only reason they even recognize even Creole culture is because they, they're seeing the monetary value in it now because um, everything was Cajun this, Cajun that, Cajun dome, Cajun, you know, Cajun, raging cage, everything. Everything is Cajun this. And now that people are, calling them out on this other aspect now they're paying attention so I mean unless there's some kind of mo immediate monetary gain I'm not sure how long it's going to take for the state to be on board but I know we need to be on board and be responsible for educating ourselves and our communities those who know um, whether that's writing books doing workshops films we have to do that work now because we're at, a, we're at a, a very important time where people's consciousness is, is shifting and they're more open-minded than they were 10 years ago about this kind of thing. And um, I know 10 years ago, I was very afraid to even present my research because it sounds probably kind of normal to y'all, but this is a touchy subject in Louisiana. This is really touchy for people. I mean, I've gotten all kind of responses. I've gotten mostly good, but you know, some people, they don't really want to hear what I have to say because it really hits home and it, it really is going to shake up the whole economy of Louisiana to tell a people who have dominated and colonized the region that they don't really have any type of cultural grounding to stand on. That's, that's a big thing because when you tell them all the one through 10 of what you say is Cajun, eight of those things are actually African. What are we actually standing on now? They built their whole, the whole region on that cultural identity that really in a lot of ways doesn't exist in the way that they think it does. So I want you to go a bit deeper for me, if you don't mind. So yeah. what if this documentary would have existed when you were in grade school? If I was in grade school, how, how will your work impact this cultural identity, sh uh, cultural identity shift that's yeah. happening and how would it would impact? Can you speak more to that? Yeah, absolutely. I believe that to be honest, I think that more of us would identify with Blackness more, um, and more of us would identify with being African. Um, I know that in my family, we were uniquely identified as being, we, we were considered Creole, we 
we grew up being called, you know, by our parents, being told that we were Creole, we were Black and African. We grew up like that. But most of my cousins, they grew up as Creole. And for that reason, their Creole identity was very associated with Europeanness, whiteness, Frenchness. And if we had had that, we would be a whole different community of people. We would be a people who were proud to be African, proud to be, prouder to be, some of us are still proud to be Black, but prouder to be Black. And we would be a community of people who really, I believe, would fight harder against the oppressive white people who are in office if we really understood um, who we were. But I think right now we feel entangled. We feel connected to them culturally and historically because we don't really tell the truth about what really happened. You know, um, a lot of us are biologically mixed. That's a thing in Louisiana. We know that's a thing, but how, how did that happen? And telling the truth about how the mixing happened I believe would also transform identity because when I was growing up, I had an association with French being French, but I was called a Frenchman. Even though I was called the other things, I still had this association, but now I don't, I don't even want to be associated with it because I know what really went down. I understand it deeply. So I believe we would have, we would kind of shift from that kind of Creole French kind of identity and move on to something more Afrocentric. I really believe that. And I and I do think that that's happening in some pockets for sure. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yes, you did. And um, being since I know you went to Temple or, you know, you're wrapping up things at Temple on the talk that Dr. Grimm was just on with Drs. Um, Karinga Gamich um, and uh, Dr. Asante, he spoke to the scientists not even knowing his true history because when you when you do your history, you will learn he will learn that you have Italians that were also lynched in Southwest Louisiana when it came to whatever history. So you fight for something to not even know about your own history at, at this point. So knowing who we are, knowing our history, knowing what side of the fight we should be on, right? That matters in relation to knowing you know, our history here. And even when you look at this governor of Florida, for him to not even know his own history and how he is impacted by this as well. Well, that says a lot about the impact of making sure we read, right? Um, yeah. We do have two questions from the audience. It looks like three now. Um, Kevin yeah. asks, do we know specific West African language gives us the words gumbo and okra or do they appear in several West African languages? That's a good question. They actually appear in several. So. Um, the term, and I can actually write it, is like gumbo with an N in front. That actually occurs in Congo region. Um, and then we also have instances of gumbo occurring throughout West Africa. You have it being used um, in places like Senegal. So I've traveled to Senegal a few times and I've seen it used there. Um, it is still used there. They use other terms, but you know, there's so many languages in, you know, in Africa and West Africa. They use other terms for okra. But gumbo is used in Senegal. It is also used in, in the Congo region. Um, so I can't say the specific language in the Congo region, but I know for sure in Wolof, they do also use gumbo. Nice. Um, Kim Rutley says, phenomenal work. She asks, are you planning to submit the documentary to film festivals? Oh, good question. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's actually what we're working on now. Jennifer um is uh an amazing consultant on this film project so we're actually working on that we literally had a meeting to get that situated yesterday so we're going to be doing that in order to also um be able to stream it um at universities because it's a very like educational type of documentary and so we want more uh, people to have access to it um from the educational perspective so we need to submit to film festivals go figure to even get it to that point so yeah we're definitely doing that thank you thank you so much and also just gave me the idea and I'm sure uh Dr. Grimm will approve maybe we could also have it posted on NCBS's website under you know media or something we can create that so that way scholars who are working on works like these can um start building a collection up on our website as well to have this scholarship accessible to more people so we can definitely talk about that as well that would be awesome 
Yes, um, we have a question from Marilyn Thomas. Can you speak to identification, Creole, and colorism in Louisiana? Oh, Marilyn, that's a whole semester class. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, um, does skin tone speak to identifying as Creole, or what are the complexities of that? Excellent question. So initially, when I um, was working on the film, so mind you, I started this film actually about 10 years ago. I don't think I talked about the process. But I started the film about 10 years ago when I was just finishing undergrad. And um, this is before I even started my master's program, all that, right? And um, initially I wanted, to, the initial working title was Too Black to be Creole. I'm sure if you Googled it, maybe it would still come up because we did some you know, small screenings and everything. Um, and, and it had a lot to do with the, my experience. So absolutely color plays a role in the identity part. And so what I really wanted to do in the original approach was to ensure that darker skinned Creole people or people in the Creole community like myself were um, not being erased from the narrative. Um, and not to say they were being fully erased, but there was a lot of like, you know, in certain pockets, Creole was associated with a color, not in every place, right? Because I don't feel like it's the same in Southwest Louisiana as it is like in New Orleans, like where Creole is almost synonymous with being light skin but at the same time there was a lot of colorism and so sometimes what I would call myself Creole like because that's the community I'm from that's literally technically who I am um I don't necessarily identify with that now but that's I'm a part of that right um people would be like you too black for that like you too dark like people would just straight up tell me people in the community people outside of the community would tell me that growing up and so I'm like how you gonna tell me I'm too black to be a part of my own people so there was a lot of like but, but because of that association with being French and this over articulation of the contribution of French and European people the African people are like not even a part of it in some in some people's psyches even though they're the ones who brought when you think about Creole culture the language the way we talk the way we treat people our family structure our food our language our music that all is rooted in Africa. But if you're associating all of that with Europe, then when you're going to have the people who are on the other side of the complex, the skin uh, complexion or spectrum, they almost become like outside of that narrative, which is really backwards. So um, that was actually the original approach. But I decided to, to postpone that because I felt, and my ancestors really pushed me in this other direction, um, that I didn't want my me as a person from who's actually from the community which is rare that you have somebody who's actually from the community talk about our culture a lot of times it's outsiders who really don't know what they're talking about but it was rare that you have people that's actually from the culture so I didn't want to be the first thing I put out there to be something negative about our culture because it's already a, a, a part that something that people think about so I wanted to talk about the greater cultural thing and connect that to Africa to understand that and then get into okay let's talk about the colorism thing. Cause it's not just a Louisiana thing. It's, it's everywhere where people have been colonized and enslaved, you have colorism. And I didn't want our culture to be, to be synonymous with that being an issue. Um, but it's something I am going to address. I'm actually working on a, a memoir about my personal experience and you know, working on how we can talk about that. We are actually, our next iteration of the film is going to be a web series. And then one of the, not a web series, a docu-series, and one of the uh, episodes is going to be on that topic. But I didn't want the whole culture to be diminished, like to be reduced to just colorism, because that's not really who we are. That's a part of one of our challenges. All communities have challenges. And um, I, I just refuse to make that the forefront. But absolutely, colorism, we all deal with colorism. I'm not even, I'm in the middle on the spectrum, to be honest. But, you know, it's all subjective, depending on your family. You know, my great grandmother, you know, could have passed for white, whereas, you know, my great grandfather on the other side was extremely dark skinned. You know, you have a very wide spectrum of color. And, you know, you have a very wide spectrum of color. And, you know, you have Are you talking? a very wide spectrum of color. And, you know, you have. Are you talking a very wide spectrum of color? And you know, you have 
Are you talking about a very wide I'm spectrum not. of color? And you know, you have are you talking about a very wide I'm spectrum not. of color? And you know, you have are you talking? No, um, our live stream has started replaying itself, so I just ended it. It's fine. Oh, I was like, that's the spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say, whoa, like ancestors chiming they, in. Yeah, the ancestors <laughs> like, girl, you better talk about it because they kept repeating that same little line. Yeah. But yeah, in some, it is a thing, and it's something I do want to address. It's important to address, but I didn't want that to be the first thing I address. I don't want our culture to be only because there's so much more um to who we are and um I just didn't think that that was the first priority but it is definitely important thank you Dr. Gary for all of your insights um as a part of this conversation I also have a question because you know I'm really fascinated and particularly um concerned with the way the younger generation is able to embrace and and even adapt African culture, or at least pieces of the culture in their own day-to-day -day, um, life or task, or even in their community. And I know for this particular documentary, the technique that you used is very specific to our discipline, Afropornography, yes. um, to an Africologist. And I wanted to know, you know, because we dedicate time to exploring and deconstructing um, different parts of the African phenomena, how can younger generation use this documentary as a starting point? And how can they better understand Creole culture in Southwest Louisiana? Because um, just from my own personal understandings and things that I've observed, even though I have family from Louisiana, spe specifically Mart St. Martinsville, the only thing that I really knew about Creole culture outside of the things that my family had done was pop culture and in pop culture they always um use creoleness or creole culture as like this voodoo really negative really dark um culture and people so how can this documentary help aid the younger generation in understanding just creole culture <laughs> good question i love how the, the younger generation chimed in on that <laughs> right <laughs> and I think like the I'm glad you brought up the part about voodoo and that was really important for me to include because it's a very stigmatized religion and and that's why I wanted to talk about where it comes from you know our African spirituality is not evil it's not demonic um that is it's powerful and because it's so powerful it has been deemed those things to dissuade us from tapping into it and so I know like for the longest you know when I would tell people my people from Louisiana oh you do voodoo and it was like this it was always a thing like in college it was really I never heard that until I got to college but I guess it's because you know in college people come from all different places you know it, it literally with dating that's exactly what I'm this is I'm talking about men who I was dating who would make those oh don't eat spaghetti from her and like they would make those types of comments to me and I'm looking like I don't even know what you're talking about you know but that was the associate especially with dating huge part of it um and I think it's just um again by design to just you know to try to convince us that who we are is not good enough that it's inferior that it's evil that it's demonic barbaric and it's really none of those things and so Vodou and I didn't go into too much too much detail there but, you know, I think RJ, who was in the film, talked about it. He, you know, talked about it's about nature. It's about understanding the balance. It's, it's about my eyes, literally. Um, and it's about respecting all these elements, creating balance um, within these elements in our environment and being able to use those things. Now, of course, people can use them for negative things, but people can also use them for positive things like a threat is going to heal you. But you don't get told the story about that. You get told these stories about dolls and, you know, all these things really to demonize our culture, basically. And you have to realize that Vodun is so powerful that it, you know, you know, was the, that was what launched the Haitian revolution, right? That is something that white people feared. They didn't understand it. They didn't know how to use it. And they understood the power that we could have when we fully tapped into it. So, of course, they're going to demonize it because they don't want us to be tapped in, right? 
and it's not just voodoo it's it's all African spiritual practices from, you know, Ifa, all these things. Um, because really most of what we're practicing uh, in Louisiana, you know, Vodou is actually from Benin. Um, and then some of that, some of our people are from Benin. I know me, I do have ancestry from, you know, what was once Dahomey, but most of us really are practicing Senegalese or Senegambian traditions or things from Mali, which is a little bit different but it's all African spirituality. So it just shows you the lack of education about where they actually came from in the first place. Um, and the fact that we're really, tr everything that we do is looked down upon. And we're always, we're told that we're, uh, speak a broken language, which means we're a broken people like D Dr. Mazamo used to say, right? So all these things are by design to break us down as a people and disconnect us from who we are. There's nothing wrong with, as RJ said, he he believes in it, but he still go to church. <laughs> like people, and I feel like people in Louisiana do that. They don't really talk about it, but that's something that is a norm, I think, for especially for the older generation that, you know, they will get to get into some roots and doing all this kind of stuff and going into a back room to, to do certain things, but they'll be at church on Sunday. So mm -hmm. it's just something that we kind of like, it's very taboo to speak publicly about. So I was really surprised. I was interviewing RJ about music because he's a Zydeco artist and he started talking about all this other stuff. So I'm like, this is the perfect interview, interviewee, you know? So I was really happy because most people, I know a trait to personally, she will not speak publicly about her work because it's so sacred. Yeah, and that speaks to also how effortlessly the things uh, the cultural customs are seamless in both distinct cultures. But I'm sorry, Alicia, where are you going? Uh, um, let me see. Scrying Jeffers, uh, Kia has a question. She uh, raised her hand. So I'm going to hit the allow to talk so that way she can ask oh. her question. All right. Uh, Kia, you're able to come off mute at this time and ask your question. I am so sorry. I think I hit it by accident. <laughs> Oh, no problem. Thank you for joining us. But I will say this is such an excellent talk. Congratulations on your work. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank really. you. And Lindsay, really quick, we have a question from Kevin. Can you quickly explain or briefly explain Afronography? Oh, okay. Yes. So um, thank you for that. So I, th I think we were getting at that. We went on a tangent, which is fine. Um, so Afronography is a technique that I was using, a method that I was using. Um, it's um, it's an Afrocentric method basically to, uh, you know, collect oral histories, to uh, gather cultural information from various communities within um, the global African diaspora and, and the African continent. And so the approach is to make sure that the the uh the people that we're interviewing the way that we're interviewing the way that we're collecting information is beneficial um through to African people but also told through um a perspective that centers their stories and that is fundamental because as I mentioned before a lot of our culture has been written about but not by us I don't know how many articles I read um in this process scholarly articles that were published that were written by people who don't know us and are making claims about stuff that they do not know and that is that is a crime it's a crime um and many of them are also being compensated to tell our stories so it goes against that you know it's it's an, it's a you know when we look at you know anthropology Although we have a lot more um, progress that has been made in that field, for example, uh, the the or origins are quite racial, you know, racialized. It's the study of the other. And so when you're conducting, for example, ethnographic research, it's, but particularly in the past, a lot of that research was approached from a very, you know, Eurocentric perspective. You know, so you're saying, oh, they're doing this because, uh, for example, it's like saying, oh, um, Louisiana people are, you know, uh, let's say 
uh, riding horses because they were influenced by a Western on TV. Now that's not what people say, but just as an example, but you're not thinking about how the, where they come from and how this can be something that they maintain. You're just automatically applying a very biased a, a mindset and perspective to whatever you're researching without doing the due diligence of, of looking at their history. So essentially this is going to illuminate a different result yield a different result because of a different approach and a different perspective so it's something that um is very important in the, in this work that we understand how to talk to our people <laughs> so. and we have one more question from miss marilyn thomas are children in current day Louisiana encouraged in schools to strengthen their command of Louisiana Creole or is it iced out of language classes? I'm also thinking of how Gullah Geechee children are led away from speaking their language in schools in the past. What is the current state of language and school in terms of acceptance in Louisiana today? Thank you, Marilyn. Yes, and can you leave that question there because I want to read it because it's, it's a... Let me, let me. So, um, as our let children me, turn day, uh, in terms of that first part, um, our children in current day Louisiana encourage no, as I told you before, for many years, the language was called a dialect, they, they didn't even recognize it as a language. Let's be clear, and that's, I mean, I'm talking about till, up to like the last few years, um, and so for that reason a lot of our people don't even want to speak it, right? Because they don't think it's valuable enough or they didn't think it was valuable enough. I remember hearing my older, like my grandparents and like older generations speaking it, you know, and they were in their generation, like they were, they were hit in school for speaking it. They were taught that they couldn't speak it in school. So they didn't teach it to my parents who didn't speak it or maybe understood it which means I didn't learn it. And now you have groups who are encouraging this, but this is community groups, mainly. You don't see this at the structural, like educational level as much where people are trying to, it's all about, as I think Alicia said, Dr. Fontenay said, it's all about French. French, 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 French. Um, and the second question, I'm also thinking of how Gullah Geechee children are led away from speaking their language in the school. Yeah. Very similar. What is the current state of language? Yeah, so just same thing. You know, it's French. It's because that is the the legacy of Louisiana by those who are in power. Is there French people? I mean, these people are French people. They are French, Canadian, or, or, or Acadian. They are French, the people that are in power for the most part. So, of course, they're going to want to preserve their own legacy and impose that onto other people just like they did before. So um, the people that are trying to teach the Creole now are more so like community groups um, who are trying to maintain the culture. Um, and there is there is a renaissance, I will say, where you have people who are my age who maybe didn't have parents who spoke it fluently, who are you know reaching back and trying to preserve it. Um, I I know of a teacher, for example, um, who, at, at, who she works at UL, but she also is um, working at the French Alliance in Lafayette and they teach Corvini, they teach Louisiana Creole um, and people can sign up for that class. So there are people who are doing that work to keep it alive. But even when people, I wanna add this at the same time, even though it's not widely spoken, I come from a, a family where my, my grandmother, she never learned English formally, right? where her little brother didn't start learning English until he was six years old when he went to school, right? So I come, that's the kind of family I come from where English was not our first language, okay? It was something that we had to be taught. Um, it's something that people didn't speak in their neighborhoods. They spoke that when they went to the outside, you know, outside of their communities. Even in, in um Port Arthur, my dad was like the first child of his six siblings born in Port Arthur, um, which is on the border between Louisiana and Texas. And he talks about how his mother, even until the 60s and 70s, she didn't even speak 
English to her neighbors <laughs> in Port Arthur, you know, which is in Texas. So it just speaks volumes on the language preservation, but yet my dad doesn't speak it, right? Um, he understands this. Um, so point is, it's something that we need to preserve, but also keep in mind that even, even if this particular iteration of the language didn't exist in the future, which it will, because we're going to preserve it, but if it didn't, the grammar is not going anywhere. Because if you hear Louisiana people talk English, when they speak English, their English is different. <laughs> It has a different grammatical structure than your so-called standard English. So it, it, it gives me hope that to know that we're still going to speak the way we speak, even if our lexicon is different, even if it's English lexicon versus French, our grammar is still consistent. Like make groceries. Everybody don't say that. Everybody don't say make groceries. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about. So yeah. I'm laughing because when I first moved to LA, I was like, make grocery and then don't let me say get down. I no, I mean, get out of the car. I'm like, I need you to get down. Right. <laughs> it don't make sense. I need you it's to get down, right? Way. It's a different way of talking and the, yeah. the structure is different. So it, it's- but Don't they it, save the groceries? There's like saving them from what? <laughs> they don't understand. So, so, it's, so the point is, it's, we're going to preserve it, but just know that it's not dead anyway in the first place. It's still there. Thank you so much. So Dr. Lindsay, if, um, and I, I appreciate the audience. I know we're over just a little bit. I promise we're about to wrap up. Um, if you had to leave the, well, if you had to pick something to leave our audience with tonight, what do you want them to leave from here? Keeping in mind. I want them to keep in mind that this film is about Louisiana, but this can be applied to so many other places. This can be applied to so many other regions in the world. And so I want us to look deeply at whatever immediate culture we come from. So if we, you know, grew up in Mississippi or grew up in Houston, wherever we're from, grew up in the Caribbean, really look and analyze our culture from another perspective and say, hmm, maybe what we are doing is still African. We don't have, we, I think a lot of times we think that because what we're doing here doesn't look exactly like what's being done in Africa that is not African. And I think that's a huge misconception. You know, riding a cowboy is not un-African. I mean, riding a horse is not un-African. So I just want us to think deeply about our culture and really start to analyze like, hmm, is it Southern hospitality or is it African hospitality that was brought by African people to the South that we just happened to be in the South and now it's Southern. Like really thinking about those things in a different way, I think, will help us to understand how this can be applicable to all of us in the diaspora, especially. So I thank, think thank you so much. I would love to thank Dr. Gary and Jennifer for their time tonight. This will not be the last time you see these ladies as we have discussed uh, partnering on future projects, which we will intentionally be sure to get the larger NCBS as well as Black Studies family involved. Um, I also do want to bring your attention to a link that I'm about to put in the chat for everyone. Our president, Dr. Valerie Grimm, she has had a busy evening. Like prior to coming on here, she was on a talk with faculty at Cal Beach with, you know, Dr. Skaranga, Asante, and Gamage. She came here. And then now she is currently on a podcast with Dr. Sundiata, who, who we know is at the, you know, um, in um, Illinois, right? Um, and she's on a podcast, on his podcast right now, History as um, a Weapon for, Black History as a Weapon for uh, Liberation. So if you're able to join her, please, this is a full day of scholarship and evening of scholarship for NCBS. Um, again, thank you, Lindsay, Jennifer. Um, this information is amazing. And we're going to continue to do this work to get this out here. You know, your work is very personal to me as well. You know, being since we're from the same area, grew up, you know, same, you know, same hoods as we say, right? Like, you know, it's no shame in how we speak. You know, we're from the same hood, right? Um, so I appreciate you. I thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us for our talk. Thank, thank you. So you. Thank you.